So I'm going to record this thing and I'm going to paint while you guys are arriving today. So let's just change to a overhead view of everything and I'm going to throw some paint on this palette and paint and talk and talk and paint while I'm trying to do stuff here because that's kind of fun. Oh gosh, look at all the people showing up. This is amazing. This is wonderful. I like it when I get a lot of people showing up. So I'm gonna boop and boop and a little bit of that. What colors are in here? Violet, better throw some violet down here on a puddle. All right, green. Yeah, better throw some green into a puddle. Okay, all right. So I got a couple of colors here that I can work with. So you guys are showing up. We got Skylar, Amanda, Ezra, yay, that's cool. So I thought I might just throw a little bit of this in here where you guys can see it and work on it while people are arriving today. So should have been doing this 10 minutes ago, but I was out building a kiln and then working on stuff for bronze casting. So let's blame the bronze casters for all of this. Um, when I'm looking at uh, this painting here, I'm trying to respond to some of the movement that is happening in the um, shadows around the face, the shadows in the hair and that kind of stuff. And so I'm gonna try to um, get something like that going here in terms of this S curve going like that. And try to get a little bit more of a, a lower value color happening here. I thought I might try the green and then I might come back with the violet afterwards. I don't know. Call me crazy, but so I'm going to just bloop this, bloop this right here, bloop, and then bloop something like that. I'm just trying, I'm trying to be inspired by the, the quality and the shape of the S curves that are in the original painting and so I'm just trying to go bloop and follow what the colors are doing. I've got a terrible brush for this so that's fine and there's a whole bunch of low value shadowy kind of hair right next to the face over here so I'm going to try to just you know do that and I'm not doing it in a straight line I'm trying to kind of like be somewhat um, influenced by the directionality and everything that he was doing there and you know what i still don't have these things going so i'm going to greet you guys as you're coming in it's two minutes after one o'clock and we're getting this thing started and that's nice let's see we got some hair that is continuing continuing to trail out here so i'm going to have to do something like that and something like that, just to move some of those S curves out there and a little bit more of, I don't know what that was. And I don't know what that was, but something like that. All right. And then it is two minutes after, three minutes after. So while we're still waiting for maybe a couple more people, I'm going to come back in here with the violet and see what happens if I go violet over green, because I've never done violet over green before. And I've changed brushes so that I'm kind of got my little line brush going on here. And just gonna see what happens when I pull some of these little, little kind of movementy lines, trying to follow some of the movement and I don't know, some of the poetry of what's going on here with all of this. So I'm kind of pulling down and then I'm going out. I'm going to pull down and then kind of flip it out and fling it out and just see what happens. I'm uh, not doing a great, super wonderful analysis of the color shapes, but I am trying to be kind of aware of what the original artist did in terms of the color shapes and trying to follow the feeling of some of those things. And before I come back to you guys, I just want to do something to reinforce the eyes a little bit because the eyes feel a little bit 
light to me. I just wanted to try to get a little bit more depth. Maybe try to get something of the iris portion of the eye happening. Just that much should do it. And we did this little plink right there. Um, kind of a dimple, kind of a shadow. And so we're just going to reinforce a little bit that uh, Cupid's bow, Cupid, and a little bit of that right there, and a little bit of that there. Okay, through the brush into the water. I'm coming back to you guys. Um, what am I doing here? Um, well, I'm working on one of these subjective color projects. I've got a bunch of them. Um, made a bunch of copies on cardstock and was doing this one as kind of a demo for you guys. Um, this is Botticelli's Birth of Venus from the middle of the 15th century, about 1480 or something are the dates on Venus. Um, this was in our history, you know, one of the first, if not the first um, uh, female nudes that were done, you know, after um, the uh, uh, after antiquity, the age of antiquity, um, uh, the Greek and Roman period, um, there was a thousand years in the Middle Ages when there was not a whole lot happening in terms of figurative art. And so um, for me, as a figurative artist, I do call them the Dark Ages for a reason, because there was a lot of religious art and it was wonderful. Everybody likes religious art, but um, not a lot happening with the human figure. So this was the first female nude, I think, that um, was done as a major piece, um, you know, after about a uh, thousand years of nothing going on. So the art history books say that I'm sure that there were lesser pieces or not pieces that were not as famous that may have been executed in that time. But um, this is something that was executed at the beginning of the uh, Italian Renaissance. And so um, I suppose I should actually be showing you what I'm doing. I'm still reinforcing some of the shadows around her face and trying to pick up on a lot of the shadow shapes that are in, in the original. So I'm looking at all of these kind of shadow shapes because shadows are actually a really important part of the structure of the piece. So trying to find the shadows and the shadow shapes and reinforce them in the piece is important. This is the one I've been doing for you guys. And this is the one that I was doing for the morning class. So you can kind of see the different color um, choices and different color structure for background, um, for flesh tones, for hair color, you know, creates a slightly different impact it has a slightly different meaning it brings slightly different content to the viewer you know when you make these color choices and so subjective color teaches us that there's a great amount of power in making subjective color choices um, that are about your choices or what kinds of things that cool effects or whatever that you want to be able to achieve in the piece or the kind of content that you want to convey to the viewer. Um, so anyway, this one over here is just a little bit more um, perhaps naturalistic flesh tones and a little bit more like the original painting, while this one that we've been working on is a uh, variation on a theme. And so it's kind of interesting to play with different tones. And again, you know, I'm using violet in the background, green, uh, for the flesh, for the most part, um, some oranges in the hair, but I'm pulling the green and the violet into the hair for the shadows and some of the low lights uh, of the tresses and the, the flowing hair. <clears throat> and that kind of helps to unify the composition. You don't want to just have um, one color shape or one color dominating one area of the composition and have it appear nowhere else in the composition. You have to be able to bring some of that violet over to the other side. You have to be able to bring some of that violet into the center of the composition. Um, and so since it's a low key value, you know, I can use it 
for lines. I can use it for contours and contour lines, as well as uh, mixing in a little bit of white so that I get a tint of violet to be able to give me that dominant background um, value that also tends to recede in space because it is both dark and cool and tinted so that it's somewhat neutralized. And so all of those things together do really neutralize the violet and make it recede into the background while the green and especially the yellow oranges tend to really pop forward into the composition. Um, <clears throat> we're in the second week of, well, we're beginning the first full week of this. I introduced this project on wet Wednesday of last week and now I am here and hopefully you guys have either had a chance to get started on it or at least be able to watch several of these videos and start to get into the headspace where you feel like you can take on one of these things and paint it. Um, well, one other thing I want to say is that as I paint this thing, um, it is really nice to paint for half an hour and then get away from it, come back for half an hour or an hour and then get away from it for half a day. Because when you come back with fresh eyes, sometimes you can see the problems that you're having with edges or shapes or something. And with paint, you can paint over a problem and you can move an edge. You can improve um, a, uh, an area of the composition that is relatively weak. And let's just try that one more time before I take attendance because I'm so crazy and I'm a nut and I do this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna get a little bit of this brush cleaned off of here. Trying to make a little bit of a tint of green so that I've got a light green. I think you guys can see me working on that on here. And there, now right here, this piece of green is out of place. And it's like, it's a brush stroke that isn't helping me out. And some might say, yes, that's kind of underneath this cheekbone right here in the hollow of the cheek. But when I look at the original over here, she really doesn't need any help with creating any kind of a hollow underneath that cheek. So to make it look a little bit more like the original, I think I'm gonna to try to maybe paint that out somehow, but I might have to have a little bit more white on my brush to be able to do that. So I'm gonna just kind of paint that out and blend that in and come up against there a little bit more with some of this. So, You can kind of see that you can come around here, and continue to cut in up against shapes and edges and stuff like that. It's almost like painting a house where you cut in around the windows, you cut in around a shape. And then if you've gone too far, you can always kind of come back and fix it later by mopping a little bit more of the color around and in there. Let's see. I don't like this part right here. So I'm gonna cut in right up against that and get that to go away. All right. All right, time to take attendance and see how you guys are doing. So by doing a little bit of that, I took some of the jaggedness and some of the intrusions out of the uh, portrait. And what I'm trying to restore here is this absolutely beautiful oval shape that almost is featureless because um, Botticelli is painting her as Venus, the goddess of love, being born out of the ocean. That's the way that the myth reads. And so um, even though she's you know, totally beautiful and all of that kind of stuff, she is brand new and fresh and innocent and pure. And so he's trying to get that purity of spirit by having an almost featureless face that doesn't have any lines, no cares, no worries, no nothing. You know, she is just totally calm and poised and beautiful and whatnot, blowing in by the gentle breezes onto the shore. And so I wanted to go back in there at any place where it looked like that there was a, a, an edge or uh, a worry line or something like that. I wanted to try to relieve that, to try to get this, this curve, this, this um, outside oval contour to be just as lovely as possible. And since I've got some stuff on my brush, I can kind of come in here and fix a few other things too 
as long as I want to cut in around there. And everything I'm doing is to try to get that, that, that roundness of form, that oval happening without any you know, cheekbones or anything else kind of jutting out or sticking out, interrupting that very, very smooth contour. In this particular case, the contour that you're looking for. Um, as long as I've got a dirty brush, I'm just going to do a little bit more of this just to increase a little bit of this stuff before I lay down my brush and come in and talk to you guys about this stuff. All right, just a little bit of this and this and this. And to get a little bit more of these S shaped, S stroke kind of. Um, uh, tresses, uh, low lights in the hair um, to kind of give a little bit more depth and balance to the um, what's going on because the highlights really just kind of take over and they just do wonderful things. So I'm just I'm, I'm moving that around with S shaped curvilinear kinds of brush strokes to get that feeling happening there. Okay. And so the brush has gone into the wash water and this thing is, I'm gonna allow this to dry for a little while. That's the concept, a um, <clears throat> subjective color composition, uh, recapitulating um, the idea of an original masterpiece and kind of playing off the idea of subjective color that somebody like Andy Warhol might've uh, approached it with um, in his, inimitable fashion back in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s. And so um, there you have it. All right, I'm looking at you guys. I got the participants list up there and I'm gonna take attendance. And then I would love to entertain any discussion that you might have about this. So questions, comments, concerns. If you've tried something and you feel like you've totally botched it already, let's talk about that as we, uh, get together and talk with our time together here. Ezra is here, so I'm gonna take attendance real quick. Gabby is there, um, Mary is here. Let me just say in my defense that um, I realized that I haven't looked at uh, grading since about midterm. And so I jumped in, I did a bunch of grading for the morning class this morning, and then I got sidetracked with build, rebuilding a kiln this afternoon, so I will get your grading caught up. You've got, a, you've got stuff going all the way back to simultaneous contrast that I haven't graded yet. Um, so I'll get the grading caught up for you guys. And then your job this week is gonna be to do this, this painting right here. Some people have done multiple paintings. Gabby, Mary, Skyler is here. And Amanda is there. Here, Skylar, Gabby, Mary, Amanda. That's it. That's all we got. Okay. So, welcome to you. I'm recording this for posterity so that those who aren't here today can try to follow along on what we're doing in these subjective color paintings. I also wanted to say that um, if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and unmute your mic and I'll be able to see it and call on you. Um, and we can kind of launch in any kind of discussion you might want to have. But when I was talking about being able to frame a painting and turn one of these design projects, one of these lowly design projects into a nice work of art, well, that's definitely something that can happen with this um, interpretation too. Again, another homage, perhaps this time an homage to Botticelli, you know, as this was an homage to Cezanne. And, you know, for $10 frame over at Walmart, um, you can't do any better for something that would be a really welcome decorative piece for your wall um, anywhere in your apartment or home or flat or whatever. So having said all that and given you guys all kinds of time to ask me questions, does anybody have any question or comment about this project? If you have any questions about my project, I can redo the bird's eye view and we can um, dive into um, some of the details of this thing too. Hey, Skylar, look at that, what's up? Um, so I don't necessarily have a question. Um, I started this um, like kind of over the weekend and I've been working on it slowly. 
Um, and I just, I kind of wanted to get your opinion on it just to see oh, what no. I could possibly fix or do better. All right. I better click on the screen share so multiple participants can share. I know what's coming. I'm afraid you were the one who was talking about doing a screen uh, grab. Okay, let's see it. How bad could it be, really? A screen grab of me, huh? No, hopefully. No. Hopefully it's one of the other projects instead. That would be good. Here it comes. Hey, there it is. All right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, isn't this interesting? I'm going to have to uh, get rid of some of this stuff. Okay. So the background color is um, a tint of green, perhaps with a tiny little blue. Um, in the background, it's it's very neutral. And so it tends to recede into the background quite nicely. The, the red orange hair tends to advance towards the viewer and it's a neutralized hair. There's lots of neutrals in there, neutralizing with white and then some of those brush strokes um, are working real good. Um, because with hair, you're going to have highlights. So you're going to use, you know, white, you know, or a higher key value color as the highlights. And then low lights, you're going to use the violet or black or some kind of lower key value for low lights in the hair. And that's what hair does. And that's why hair is so interesting to do and complex to do is because it's got highlights, medium tones, which is the actual color of the hair, and low lights, which are the shadows between the hair and on the underside of the tresses of the hair. You've got the little uh, binding cords that um, kind of go around some of her hair um, uh, uh, stuff. She's got a hell of a lot of hair, doesn't she? I mean, look at all of that hair. It's like, it's like a big sheaf of wheat over on the right side of her neck. And then there's a chunk of hair that she's got another um, ponytail holder around on the left side too. You picked up on that. I didn't see that, but it, it's not clearly, it's not clear in my version. Um, so, and now you're, you're using some really fine lines, drawing in some of the contour lines um, around the eyes, nose, and mouth, which is kind of nice. Um, I want you to kind of be careful with contour lines too, because contour lines can make really strong edges for shapes. And sometimes, you know, with your painterliness, it's, try, it's really hard. It's a challenge to figure out what shapes need to have um, sharply defined edges and what shapes need to have um, softly defined edges. So I love the, um, the shadow over on the left side of the forehead going into the left eye socket. And now I'm seeing it um, above the right eye too in the, in the right eye socket. Those shadows that were done with a spray can. Um, um, and so they have a really soft diffused edge to them. I really like those. And that's gonna be the tough part. You know, the lips are probably, they have a really sharply defined edge and they, they might need to get a little softened up somewhere to break up that edge just a little bit somewhere on the lips. Um, and that's the, that's the thing that painters do. They can play with those edges and with a brush and just deftly either give us a sharply defined edge or um, mash it around a little bit with the brush and give, give us an edge that's much more softly defined. Um, and we might have to see both of those kinds of edges um, on something like the lips, because right now the lips have a um, one kind of definition all the way around the edge. It's a sharply defined shape and edge that stands in contrast to the flesh around it. And so at, in some areas, at some points, you might have to just soften that edge a little bit, if possible. I like what you did with the corners of the mouth because those things go soft. And so that the use of that tool in those little um, areas where the lips end and the smile kind of goes into the cheek area and it just diffuses there in, in blue, that's nice. I like that. Okay. So yeah, the, the philtrum uh, is the area between, you know, the top of the lip, the top of the Cupid's bow. And here we are playing with Cupid and Venus. Uh, I think Cupid wound up being Venus's son. Um, 
So, um, so Cupid's bow on, on Venus's own lip right there. There you go. Um, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. I'm going into art history. This is kind of hard. Um, but yeah, these, these softer um, shadows that are uh, on the left side of the face that are, you know, uh, trying to, you know, define the cheekbone and then the hollow underneath the cheekbone and all of that. You're, you're working really hard to do very subtle things. And the subtle things are working. The more subtle it is, you know, the better. And uh, when things get uh, more sharply defined, you know, we we'll get into a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not bad. It's just, it calls attention to itself. That's, that's the problem with details like that. Sharply defined, high contrasty edges uh, definitely call a lot more attention to themselves than so more softly defined edges. Uh, I like this. This is a great thing. Now, I would consider this like a start and like you're about halfway into the painting now. How do you feel about this? How, I suppose you've got eight hours into this. And you're probably done with this painting by now. Do you want to talk to us about how much time you've spent on this? Um, I mean, it, it didn't take eight hours. <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, I, I sketched it um, on a piece of paper first that took, I don't know, probably the longest. And then I just scanned it onto the, my, um, the Fresco app. And all of this took maybe, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, but um, I'm, I'm not done. I, I know that I just wanted to get your like critiques just oh. so that way I know where to go from here. Well, and actually the, the subtle stuff that you were doing now, I'm seeing it in the left side of the neck down here um, and, and you know in the throat and everything. And I see all of the subtleties that you're working with. So you've got some of the oranges and some of the blues that you're playing with and you're trying, you're layering them, you do all kinds of fun stuff. So I see all of the work you're putting into this. Um, poor you, <laughs> this looks like a lot of work. <laughs> no, this, this is what I enjoy. This is what I do all the time. And, and I know I'm not done. I, all of these harsher angles, like the lips and the eyebrows and the bags under the eyes, like I, I, I know that I wasn't necessarily done. I just, I, I map out, I guess, where I'm wanting more, I don't know. I don't know how to put it. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Yes, that's exactly what we do. We block it out, we rough it out as a drawing, um, even in a painting, and then we go back and we address those, those lines, those edges and stuff, and we kind of like smash them down or smoosh them up or, you know, and, and try to make them dissolve. <laughs> and sometimes it's okay to have a sharply defined edge, but along the length of a line, it's kind of nice to have that line change character. So if the line can um, soften and even dissolve completely and then pick up again in strength a little bit further on down the line. As long as the line doesn't have the same character for the entire length of the line, you know, that's, that's the, the tell, that's the giveaway that it's a, it's a line and it isn't kind of completely integrated into the piece because and that took me forever to figure out. When I was a kid, you know, drawing and painting and everything, I never, and maybe I didn't have good uh, instruction either, but to, to have somebody, some authority figure, some teacher tell me that I could actually let the line go, maybe because we didn't have Frozen back then and I didn't know about the song, Let It Go. But, you know, sometimes you just got to let the let it go and um, let that line dissolve into other things you're kind of aware that it's there, but it doesn't have to be, you know, the same line through the whole thing. And so your lines are things that you stuck in there early and they're part of your sketch and, and they will probably get um, mashed up and pushed around and softened up as time goes on. That's what happens with paintings. Um, I don't know how to run a painting program. So I'm not, I don't know how many like layers you're working with or how many states you're working with and how many steps back and forward you can go with this. Cause I know you can go back and forth a lot of steps. Oh, you just open them all up. So there they all are. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a lot of tools here and sometimes tools are great. Um, and sometimes it just makes things more um, confusing. Cause when you have a thousand choices it's hard to know what to do and what to try. Mm -hmm. um, painters sometimes just uh, plod blindly forward and just make it up as we go because we don't really know 
what we can do. And the only thing we can do is go forward. So if we don't like something, we paint over it. Um, digital artists can go both forward and backward. And I, I almost sometimes think that that's a greater, um, uh, a greater burden uh, because you've know, got more choices. It's harder to take responsibility and figure out which, which is the right path. So I have talked too goddamn much. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but have it at, now that I've said all that, does that uh, inspire or prompt any more discussion on your part? Do you do you talk? Do you um, have ideas about sharp edges or soft edges, sharp shapes or soft shapes for this thing? Um, well, no, because uh, I, I studied Greek mythology. I love uh, Greek mythology, so or Roman in this case because of Venus. Um, but I, I know that Aphrodite is soft, beautiful. I know that she's, um, you know, seen as, as kind of that quote unquote baby face. So all of these um, harsher angles, I know I would take away. Um, not, not all of them, like you were saying, but um, kind of fading them to be more like, you know, how, like what you see, like with the neck or like with the, with the side of the head here. Um, okay. That's cool. The eyes, the eyes I've been struggling with just because they look kind of like granny eyes, but I don't, I don't know. So. Well, you know, that's the thing. Botticelli didn't do us any favors because he gave us um, a, a soft, ample kind of a um, upper eyelid. And then he gave us a soft, ample lower eyelid. And then perhaps you know, one more line of definition underneath the right eye. And so all you can do is just go back and soften, soften, soften that line and, you know, try to decide, you know, where you're going to place, you know, highlights and where you can soften the line so that the line isn't continuous. Um, okay. And that's the only place where you're going to really want a sharply defined edge is on the upper eyelid edge, you know, where we would put mascara, but of course they may not have had makeup or mm -hmm. mascara back yet. Actually, I think they did. And maybe he is even painting in a little bit of mascara along that eyelid, eyelash line on the top lid. Um, I really like what you've done with the eyes as far as the pupils, um, you know, kind of um, floating in limpid pools of you know that um, soft um, blue that is the iris, and then you've got a little bit more of a darker uh, iris uh, on the outside edge, and you're kind of playing with a um, a highlight kind of as a uh, crescent shape on the on the right side of each uh, eye, you know, kind of separating the iris from the pupil. Um, that's an interesting. Uh, um, interpretation and I have to go back to the original is because I can't see I, I you know I've only got a small photograph here um, that's really interesting that is really soft and that's a that's a nice uh, combination of highlights and details in the eye so that's cool that's good okay okay well I gave you like 10 or 15 minutes of feedback there which is probably way too much but maybe it's helpful for everybody else to kind of have us talk about these kinds of things. So thank you very much. You can, I guess, stop your screen share now. Um, so let me give anybody else, now that they've seen what happens when you actually let the teacher talk about your work, um, a chance to, you know, if you want to weigh in or share something or just ask me a question, you'll know that I will take five minutes and go too deep answering your question. Um, and otherwise- um, I have yeah. a question. Ezra, thank God. Hello. How are you? Hello. Uh, fine. How are you? I'm good. Um, so I actually have two questions. So I don't have a printer, so I had to draw like the Venus thing by hand and my hair <laughs> turned out a bit of a different shape. Is that fine or should I just start over? No, that's fine. That's good. Are you working in a computer program or are you doing this freehand? By hand. Okay. It's fine. And like I said, with painting, I mean, you can always adjust shapes just by taking a contrasting color and just moving it out. So, it, you know, let's, let's look at this curve of this thing right here. If I went too big and I want to bring it back in, I can just move that top contour down and in with a succeeding 
uh, application of background material or something. So you can, you can, you can just keep futzing and fussing around with your edges and your shapes until you kind of morph them and push them around until they're where you want them. And it's really just, um, it's, it's like circling the horses or um, corralling horses or something like that. I mean, you're just, you're either, you're moving the outside of the background in to bring that shape in, or you're taking the, the color of the shape and you're going out into the background just a little bit further. And you'll just kind of have to play with it, move that edge of that shape back and forth until it satisfies your needs. And it doesn't have to be exactly like this. Um, are you doing the Venus too? Um, yes. Uh, okay. Another question, uh, like how should I select colors? Uh, really, this, this is your choice. I just, I, on the, you know, I looked at what was going on with this Warhol thing and I said I didn't want red. So I was kind of interested in the light green that he used in that face. And so I kind of played with the light green here. His might be a light blue or a light blue green. I went with just a light green. I don't know why, but you know, as green is a medium, um, a medium color, medium value color. But as soon as you tint it up, then it, it gets right up into a high key value that works just as well as a peach does, you know, for that. Um, the background is the water in this case. And so you've got lots of cool choices. Um, uh, Botticelli did uh, blue green for the background. Since I thought green was not available to me anymore, I kind of went with, oops, I went with violet tinted up for water because it's still kind of a cool color to play with. And violet does a really nice job of receding in the background, especially once it is tinted, because with the tint, with the white mixed in with the violet, that really um, neutralizes the violet quite a bit, and then it recedes way into the background. The, and the, the green tinted up wants to recede too. The only thing that makes the green pop are sharp edges in the green. So all the sharply defined features of the um, facial features and the hair can keep that green pushing forward. Um, and, and the warm colors in the hair, which I've, I've kind of lost now, but I may come back with some warm highlights, can also help to pop that hair and face forward at you a little bit more. So, you know, your choices, you, you can't, you can do anything you want. You can do peach, which is an orange tinted up with some white. And that's kind of what Botticelli was starting with, was a was yellows and oranges tinted with white to give us, you know, the Caucasian flesh tones. You can do that if you want. Um, this does not exactly look like the Botticelli painting, but it resembles it. So you do what you want to do. It's okay. Um, I think that probably either a tint of blue or a tint of green um, would be fine to get yourself an alien person or, you know, some kind of a tint of a warm color. Um, orange or yellow would be fine too if you want to keep this in the spirit of Botticelli and a bit on the Caucasian side would be just fine. See, I can go five minutes and bore the hell out of you guys. Thank you for your question. That was really good. Did you, did you have another question or comment, Ezra? Uh, no, I mean, I don't know. I studied Sandra Botticelli back in high school. How do you feel about Botticelli? Um, is it... Uh, um, was it interesting? Was uh... yeah, I'd say he was pretty good, especially compared to most of the artists before, like the pre-Renaissance. Yes. So, what did you think of this nude as like the first female nude since antiquity? Was that shocking in a high school class? Um, it probably doesn't even look like a body that we would consider, you know, interesting or you know, beautiful or whatever. But for um, the 1470s, this was like shocking and amazing and, and you know, beautiful. Um, they had a different, they had different standards than we do. <laughs> Ankles and elbows, you know. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. So thank you, uh, guys. I'm not going to uh, waste your time or anything. I wanted to do a check-in today and try to jumpstart your creativity on playing with this stuff. But I really want you guys to try to jump in on this yourself 
and be like Scholar, Skyler, Skyler, and be able to share something with us, perhaps screen sharing on Wednesday as well as Friday to maybe show the different states that you're taking this painting through as you're trying to get through it. Um, this week we're doing this painting. This is our last project um, on Wednesday or Friday. I'm going to throw the uh, study guide out there for the final exam study guide 20 questions multiple choice just like we did at midterms and so next week our finals and we're just going to have you know a 20 question multiple choice final so this is really our last biggest project here that we're doing and so um, blast this out this week do a really good job on it and maybe consider framing it when you're done because you'll have an artwork i think suitable for framing when we get done with this at the end of the week I'm going to say goodbye and thank you guys for sharing this with me. I'll see you guys again on Wednesday. So uh, have a good first part of your week and goodbye.